With NASCAR trying to reinvent the schedule, street racing is on the 2023 NASCAR Cup Series season with street racing in the city of Chicago. My colleagues at Front Stretch and other fans across the country have debated the idea of street course racing. However, this is not a debate video, but reminding you that street racing and stock cars have happened before. An unknown race in a major city that was not broadcasted on TV. In 1994, the Arkham Menard Series held a race on the streets of Des Moines, Iowa for one year. Hear the history of the track and the stories from that race weekend from the drivers and the crew members themselves in this deep dive. NASCAR is no stranger to the Hawkeye State. The Rusty Wallace-built Iowa Speedway in Newton, Iowa, hosts races this year for ARCA and IndyCar and used to have the Xfinity and Truck Series race there. Sitting 35 minutes away from Iowa Speedway, Des Moines is the capital and most populous city of Iowa. ARCA was not the first series to race on the street of Des Moines. There is footage on YouTube of the Oldsmobile's Pro Series that ran the streets in 1993. All you need to know about that series is Mike Borkowski, who had a lackluster NASCAR career, was leading the points during that stage of the season. The Trans Am Series ran on the roads of Des Moines from 1989 to 1992. In 1993, Trans Am was scheduled to race at Des Moines, but already in a flood stage during race weekend, heavy thuddy storms on the Thursday before the race dumped over six inches of rain to an already rainy summer season. Massive flooding from the Des Moines River washed out the bridges on the track that would have been flooded out. The race was canceled and never made up on the Trans Am schedule. Trans Am did return to Des Moines for the 1994 season, and this time it was a doubleheader with ARCA on the 4th of July weekend. ARCA ran on Sunday, while Trans Am ran on Monday, July 4th. Drivers would start on Crockett Street, heading west and turning left into Turn 1. Inside Turn 1 and 2 is the Veterans Memorial Auditorium. The auditorium has some special history of its own, including with Ozzy Osbourne biting off the head of a bat in 1982. After turn two, drivers would make a left onto Park Street before turn three, which turned back south on 4th Street heading towards Grand Avenue. Turns four, five, and six took an S-band around Grand Avenue, 3rd Street, and Locust Street. After turn six, the cars drove on the first of two bridges on Locust Street, heading to turn seven and eight around City Hall. This picture with Jeff McClure shows pack racing as the cars driving east on Locust Street, heading right into turn 7. After turn 8, the cars would drive back westward on the Grand Avenue Bridge. Turn 9 is a 110 degree corner that goes by the YMCA, now a United States Federal Court building. Finally, the cars roar back up 2nd Avenue, the longest straightaway on the course, back up to Crockett Street. Inside turn 10 would be the future Wells Fargo Arena, now home to the minor league teams for the NHL's Minnesota Wild and NBA's Minnesota Timberwolves. Pitt Road was situated in a parking lot towards the Turn 1 side of the track. Pitt Lane exit was past Turn 1 and took a lane off of 5th Avenue. With this race being relatively unknown to most NASCAR fans, it'd be best to hear about the race weekend from the people that were there. David Hall, better known as Frog Hall, ran his self-owned number 61 car for that race. When asked about what he remembered from that race weekend, he said, quote, I put in next to James Hilton for the weekend and practiced throughout all the sessions. I said to James, I'm going to go out one last time. He told me, don't. I didn't listen. I ran the car so far under the tire barrier, I couldn't see out. They kept falling when the, I backed out. The fans went crazy every time when I went by after that. Hall said that he drove Jimmy Spencer and Mike Waltrip around in the pace car on race day. Waltrip and Spencer were at Daytona International Speedway for the Firecracker 400 weekend during practice and qualifying at Des Moines. Spencer won his first career Cup Series race at Daytona, while Waltrip finished 13th. Because they were at Daytona, both drivers had to start at the rear of the field during the ARCA race. While Waltrip was racing at Daytona, Kyle Harvey practiced and qualified the number 30 car, which was a backup car to the number 10 car driven by Glenn Brewer. Harvey did have ARCA experience running one race for Bobby Dodder in 1993 at Winchester. There was one caveat with Harvey driving Waltrip's car. Waltrip is 6 foot 5 inches tall, while Harvey is 5 foot 4 inches tall. With over a foot of a difference between the two drivers, the number 30 car had to be fitted with extra padding in the seat and blocks to reach the pedals when Harvey was driving. Racing's already not easy, but blocks on a pedal are an added difficulty. When I interviewed Waltrip, he sadly did not remember much from that day, except that he had a great time in a crappy car. I did ask him with his racing experience that he had at Des Moines 
is there a future market for street course racing for NASCAR? Man, there's so many, I think. And the, the Des Moines race was awesome. That feels like 100 years ago, you know, but racing through the streets, seeing all the folks standing along the course and big buildings around you. I mean, it was really cool. It, and I would just have the playbook wide open. And I would consider racing the, uh, the clash maybe in a park in Phoenix. Like, it doesn't have to be a, a road course necessarily. You know, if there's a big area where you could lay out a, a quarter mile or half mile track temporary and it's in the right spot with the right uh, surroundings and a lot of folks can wander up and watch. I think, I think, like I said, I believe the possibilities are endless about temporary circuits. And uh, I look forward to seeing what NASCAR figures out. Altrup would finish nine laps short of the finish due to an oil pump problem. Roger Blackstock is not a household name in NASCAR, but he helped Brad Keselowski's father, Bob's ARCA team, back in the day. A lot of people don't know the relationship that I had with Bob. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I had a real good relationship with him. Like I said, I went over there, did all the body work and paint work, helped him develop the front nose on the LeBaron that he drove. Mm -hmm. That was done in my garage at my house. During the 1994 season, Blackstock had two different car manufacturers that he drove. The Pontiac, which was used at most races in 1994, including Des Moines, was built by Bob Kozlowski. The other car was an Oldsmobile, which Blackstock and ARCA owner Charlie Newby bought, an ex-Sterling Marlin Sunoco car. Newby built some of the engines for Blackstock and used the Oldsmobile as a backup car for Newby's number 77 team. Throughout the entire season, Blackstock would rely on volunteer help with the cars while maintaining their full-time jobs. When asked about the racing service, Blackstock said... From what I can remember, it was pretty nice. It wasn't too bad. Um, they did a real nice job with it. That is interesting to note because the surface is not like a well-maintained speedway track that NASCAR prepares for. These were real streets used by the commuters of Des Moines that were fixed for the race. With 20 laps to go in the race, Blackstock ran under the tire barrier and took over six laps for the safety crew to pull him out. That's why he finished 12 laps down. When asked about NASCAR and street racing, Blackstock said, I think that NASCAR is going to try it mm -hmm. because they're trying to do anything they can do. I mean, ARCA was always adventurous. I mean, we went, we went to Topeka, Kansas and raced there before they did it. You know, we always were like the new guys going somewhere to do something back in, back in the day. For the 1996 season, Kozlowski built a brand new car for ARCA with Chrysler, the Dodge Avenger. Kozlowski was scheduled to run the Avenger in the ARCA series, but jumped up to the truck series. So Blackstock ran the model in ARCA from 1996 to 2000. Blackstock currently runs AutoQuest Collision up in Michigan. There was a Larson in this Des Moines race. No, not Kyle Larson, but Wayne Larson. Wayne Larson was a dirt racer for 35 years and did not make his first ARCA start until he was 45 years old in 1993. Entering the ARCA series was through a butterfly effect, though. Bobby Allison ran a dirt program during his racing career, but suffered career-ending injuries on the opening laps at Pocono in 1988. While recovering, he put someone in charge of the dirt program that many dirt and NASCAR fans know. Uh, well, I got to know a guy named Kenny Schrader. I think the first race I saw him at or met him where I met him was at, at, at um, Mason City at the dirt track. Um, he found a, an ARCA car for me. And so I decided to try it. I wanted to try some asphalt racing. Without that encounter, Larson would have never had an ARCA car to drive. Before the Des Moines race, Larson had never raced on a road course. Talk about being thrown to the wolves. Larson did not remember much of the race weekend, but he survived and was running at the finish. Scored five laps down, Larson scored an 11th place result, which tied his career best, which just happened to be the previous race at Michigan. Larson ran part-time in the ARCA series from 1993 to 1997, with a total of 13 starts. His son, Adam, did run an ARCA race in 1998 at Daytona and finished 25th. Today, Larson owns Larson Collision in Ames, Iowa, and has been running that business for over 47 years. On Racing References page for the results of the Des Moines race, one driver is missing their car number, Tom Bigelow. Bigelow made his name in the National Midget and National Sprint Series, Bigelow has the same amount of national midget wins as Christopher Bell and is second all-time in national sprint wins. 
In May 1989, Bigelow won his last national midget race in the same month as Jeff Gordon won his first. Bigelow has over 30 years of racing experience between the National Midget Series, CART, and even had a start in NASCAR. With that experience, Bigelow has raced on a vast amount of tracks, including a winning a race in the old Houston Astrodome. The most interesting track to him? He can only narrow it down to two. I don't know, there's so many. Probably, I think two of the most unique tracks are Winchester Speedway and Rossburg, Ohio. When asked about who was his toughest competitor that he raced against, he pointed towards the late Rich Vogel. It was a short weekend for Big Low in Des Moines, though. He attempted to race, but electrical issues in practice caused problems for his team. Big Low, not wanting to blow the motor, decided not to race that day and headed home instead. I confirmed with Big Low himself that his car number was the number 8 for the race. For some people in ARCA, it was a hometown race, especially for legendary ARCA owner Larry Clement. Clement grew up in Fort Dodge, Iowa, which is an hour and a half away from downtown Des Moines. If it was an ARCA race during the early 2000s, the orange number 46 Larry Clement owned car was in the contention to win as well as all the championships. The Des Moines race in 1994, however, was before Frank Kimmel jumped into the number 46 car. Bob Hill was driving for Clement at the time. Clement got into racing by being a sponsor of the late Howard Mellinger's racing team with Bob Hill driving. Wanted to take it up a notch, Clement enlisted Hill to drive his ARCA car for select races in the early 90s. Back in the day, Clement was the team owner, but also had duties during the race weekend of being the team's jackman. I was a jackman on a race team, which I absolutely loved to do. Mm -hmm. I played college football and most of the, a lot of sports. But I'm telling you something, when you go over the wall on a pit stop, that's the most intense thing I've ever done in my life. It is absolutely great. During that ARCA weekend, the SCCA Trans Am race ran 63 laps on the Strait of Des Moines, 12 laps less than the ARCA race. Clement was skeptical of the race distance as 75 laps for ARCA. It was longer than the Trans Am GT cars that with the big brakes and uh, everything that were designed was absolutely specifically designed for road racing. Yeah. And um, I asked ARCA, I said, that, oh, this isn't sour green, but why in the world are we running the race longer than the Trans Am series race? And... Um, well, they just decided that's what they wanted to do. So. Hill was running the top three late in the race before engine issues relegated him to a 12th place finish. Hill would not have to wait long to capture his first career ARCA win, coming at the Springfield Fairgrounds a little over a month after the Des Moines race. 1994 was only the start of Clement's successful career in ARCA. Clement's future driver, Frank Kimmel, was with a different team during the Des Moines race in 1994. Kimball has won more ARCA championships than Richard Petty or Dale Earnhardt or even Jimmy Johnson won NASCAR Cup Series championships. While Kimball did not rise up through the ranks of racing, he had a notorious ARCA career with 80 wins and 374 top 10s and 503 starts. After winning several championships locally at Charleston Speedway in Indiana, Kimball sold one of his race cars to Terry Shirley. Shirley raced that car and asked Kimball to drive for him as well. Kimmel got into ARCA when family friend Jack Wallace, who has no relation with the Wallace Racing Brothers, wanted Kimmel to drive for Wallace's team. Eventually, Shirley ran the number 02 team by 1992 and was full-time. In 1994, Kimmel's ARCA career was taking off as Kimmel scored his first career ARCA win at Toledo five weeks before the Des Moines race. With a rain-filled weekend, Kimmel started the day second in Des Moines, but road courses were not Kimmel's strong suit, as Kimmel recalls an interesting excursion during that weekend. I can remember the, making one lap around it, and I'm thinking, well, this is kind of fun. I can do this, you know, and so I started running pretty hard, and I, I, I remember taking a left-hand turn and going down. We'd, we'd gone over a bridge, and then you turn left and would go down a couple blocks, and then uh, you would turn left again and go over another bridge, if I remember correctly. And the funny thing was, I, I, I'm just, you know, running pretty hard down through that short chute there. And I'm starting to turn right because I thought that's which way I was supposed to go. And as I went into this area, this is where like the emergency crews were parked back in this corner and in this road or whatever. And 
I come in there realizing I'm going the wrong direction and there's parked cars in the way and I'm smoking the brakes trying to get this thing stopped uh, before I hit anybody. Thank God, uh, goodness I didn't. But uh, I remember their eyes were as big as mine, I'm sure. And I just put it in reverse and backed up, turned around and went the other direction. Even with that incident of taking the wrong turn, it was a good weekend for Kimmel. He recalls the atmosphere of the streets in Des Moines. I remember how cool I thought it was to get to really race on the streets. Um, that was, to me, was just one of the most, I don't know, exciting, neat things to get to do. I, I think I remember that as I was uh, coming down one straightaway, um, I looked up and there was a parking garage there. And uh, they had turned that into like suites and stuff so there's people hanging off the, the the parking garage areas waving at you and stuff and it was uh it was a neat thing you get to do uh i think that's the only street course i've ever done quietly kimmel would finish in second place in the race that took out 18 cars however there was one thing that could have ruined kimmel's day in des moines i remember taking a left hand turn and going down we'd we'd gone over a bridge and then you turn left and would go down a couple of blocks. Then uh, you would turn left again and go over another bridge, if I remember correctly. And the funny thing was, I, I, I'm just, you know, running pretty hard down through that short chute there. And I'm starting to turn right because I thought that's which way I was supposed to go. And as I went into this area, this is where like the emergency crews were parked back in this corner and in this road or whatever. And, I come in there realizing I'm going the wrong direction and there's parked cars in the way and I'm smoking the brakes trying to get this thing stopped uh, before I hit anybody. Thank God, uh, goodness I didn't, but uh, I remember their eyes were as big as mine, I'm sure. And I just put it in reverse and backed up, turned around and went the other direction. So uh, uh, I remember I did make the wrong turn uh, right off the bat, but uh, it was a lot of fun. I remember there was a, um, there was a uh, manhole cover uh, and they had actually bolted them to the ground so that the, the, the SCCA or the IndyCar type cars wouldn't suck them up. Uh, I didn't realize that would happen, but I remember it was just in one certain area and I kept running over it with my right rear tire under throttle and I could feel it slide through that steel plate. And I, and I kept saying, quit doing that to you. You're gonna break an axle or you're gonna tear up a drive plate or something dumb. And uh, the next lap, I would go and do it again. And I'd have to keep telling myself to quit hitting that thing. But uh, it, it was a lot of fun. It was enjoyable to get to do. Fun was a common thread to that day in Des Moines. There had been flack from race fans and even city council members about street racing in Chicago. I asked Kimmel about some people not being a fan of street racing. And Kimmel gave his thoughts on the topic. And people get full of themselves and they, and, and they have to understand what we're supposed to be doing. And, you know, we're... We're there to put on a show, and uh, I think the the opportunity for NASCAR to go and do that uh, is tremendous. I mean, you, you see it in every form of, of racing that they go and run a street course here and there, and I, I think it's a great opportunity, and, and I'm anxious to see how it works out, and uh, uh, hopefully it does well, and, and the people like it, and it brings more fans to our sport. Kimmel had a successful day at Des Moines, while another long-standing ARCA competitor had issues right off the bat. Another name synonymous with ARCA is Venerini. Venerini entered two cars for that weekend. Bill had his full-time entry in the number 25 car, and his son Billy was in the number 35 car. Billy practiced the number 35 and was scheduled to run the race, but there was a slight issue for Venerini Motorsports that weekend. The front tire changer did not show up in time for the race. Billy stepped out of the driver's seat to change the tires on the car. Instead, Bill Barkdahl, known for his spectacular crashes in the Daytona duels in the 80s and 90s, drove the number 35 car that day. Bill Venerini completed one lap before something broke, which relegated him to a 35th place finish. Barkdahl would have transmission issues and finished 18 laps short of the finish with an 18th place finish. While street course racing may be a new adventure for NASCAR, the Arca Menard series dabbled in street racing over 20 years ago. NASCAR will take on the streets of Chicago this weekend. Even though this is a new experience and a lot of unknowns in this, this video should be at least a reminder to provide a little history 
to the ARCA's forgotten street course race. Jared Haas with FrenchStretch.com. Make sure to hit that subscribe button. Also, check one of those two videos out that we have right beside you. Visit FrenchStretch.com for more great content.